Glad you're here today. And for me, it is an honor and a blessing to get to share God's word with you one more time. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at some passages from chapter 12 of 1 Samuel. In this chapter, uh, the prophet Samuel, the last judge, Samuel, has gathered together all the people so that uh, they can officially crown Saul as the first king of Israel. So I just want to jump right into these verses. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Samuel said to all of Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice in all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you. And now here is the king walking before you. But I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you. And I have walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am, bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? I will restore it to you. And they said, You have not defrauded us, or oppressed us, or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. And they said, He is witness. Would you pray with me, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. And Lord, we, we thank you for the sun that's shining. Lord, I thank you for the rain that we've received lately. And Father, how you're causing things to grow again, to become, to become green and to start to bloom and blossom. And Lord, I pray that you do that in our lives. Father, that uh, you would water us with your word. Lord, that you would just nurture us with your presence. Father, that you would speak instruction and inspiration into our lives this morning from your Holy Scripture. Father, we're grateful to be in your house. We're grateful to be in your presence. And Lord, we just lift up this time and offer it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in chapter 12, we have a, a coronation ceremony for King Saul. Saul has already been anointed with oil by the, the prophet Samuel, by that last judge Samuel. And that was done in a smaller ceremony, a more private ceremony. But what's going on here in this Point in this uh, chapter is no private ceremony at all. The entire nation has been gathered together to witness the official act of Saul taking his place upon the throne. And Saul is not uh, taking his place on the throne like someone who's looking to hide. God has poured out his spirit upon Saul. He's poured out his favor and his grace upon Saul. And Saul has already shown leadership within the country, within the nation. In that interim time between that private ceremony of the anointing of oil and this public coronation, Saul has already led the Israelites in battle. In chapter 11, we read about the Ammonites threatening the people of Jabez Gilead. And Saul rallies together 330,000 men to fight against the enemy. He rallies them together, and Saul leads them to a great victory over the Ammonites. God is indeed using Saul, just as he said he would, to deliver the people from the hand of the enemy. God always keeps his word. The Ammonites had threatened them, and Saul was used by God to lead the people to victory. And it's a great victory. And what do you do after any great victory? Well, you celebrate, right? If you watch the NBA playoffs, some city in a couple of weeks, a few weeks, is going to have a great celebration over this championship that they've won. Well, I would tell you that this victory here in God's Word, a victory over the enemy, is greater than any championship you could ever win. And it is a time to celebrate it. Samuel recognizes that. And so Samuel, as the people are ready and willing to celebrate, he calls them together for this public coronation of the first king of Israel. And at this ceremony, the prophet Samuel speaks to the people. I want to look at his words with you this morning in a message entitled, The Passing of the Torch. And the first thing that I want to talk to you about is that Samuel, 
uh, gives the people a call to recognize. A call to recognize. He wants them to recognize the way that he has lived and served. Uh, he lived a life of service and submission unto God. Samuel lived a life that gave glory unto God, not just in his words, but in his deeds, in all of his ways, and all of his behaviors. And in his speech, he provides several examples uh, supporting this contention that he has lived a life of submission to God. In verse 1, he says that he has listened to the voice of the people and he has appointed a king over them. And you've got to know from the rest of the, this book, from the earlier chapters, that appointing a king was not really something that Samuel wanted to do. Something he didn't want to do, and yet when he makes a reference to it, he's not moaning or groaning. He's not grumbling or complaining. He's not trying to be divisive. He is simply stating the truth, that he has anointed a king over them just as they wish. See, that was their wish, but it wasn't his wish. Uh, Samuel wanted the people to continue to have judges rule over them, to lead them. Judges who would speak on behalf of God. But the people didn't want that. The people wanted a king. The people wanted to be just like the rest of the world. They asked for a king. They prayed for a king. And God gave them what they asked for. God agreed to it. And God asked Samuel to make it happen. And even though Samuel did not like what was going on, Samuel followed God's will. And Samuel gave it his best. Samuel instructed and encouraged Saul, and he promised to give Saul godly support. Samuel was not going to stand in the way of what God was going to do. Now, I think it's important for us to, to recognize that even though Samuel did not like the plan, even though he did not care for the direction that the nation was going in, he still gave it his godly best. He didn't pout. Uh, he didn't hang his head and look wounded. He didn't complain to anybody and everybody who would listen. When God gave him a task to do, he did it, and he gave it his best, and he did it with a godly attitude. I want to tell you that in your Christian walk, there will be some things that God will allow in your life that you're not going to like. There will be some paths that you would prefer not to walk. God will ordain some things to be present to be there, to occur, to happen that you don't care for and God will ask you to do certain things in the midst of those things that you do not like. When He calls you to do something, even in the midst of, of a plan and a direction that, that you're not in total agreement with, you need to give it your best. You need to give it your best. Wherever God has planted you, bloom where you planted, a friend told me one time. I like the way Paul said it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. He said, we are to do all things without grumbling, complaining, or disputing. And we see that here in Samuel's life. Uh, something going on he really didn't care for, but he, he did not grumble. He did not argue. He honored the Lord in all things, even things he did not like. And he calls the people to recognize that. He calls the people to recognize that he tried to live in a godly way and do the right thing. And he wants them to know that that was his heart. And that's how he wanted his ministry to be remembered. In verse 2 he says that he has walked before them all the days of his youth. You may remember that his mother dedicated him to the Lord before he was born and he went to serve in the temple. And uh, so he's been there, he's been involved in ministry, and all his life he's been faithful not only to God, but he has been faithful to them. He's always been open and honest with them. He's never taken any bribes or defrauded anyone. He calls the people, can anybody say I've done you wrong? Can anybody say that I've cheated you? Let me know and I will make it right, right now. And they said, no, no, you've never done anything untoward in regard to your behavior with us. He always dealt in integrity. Oh my goodness, that is so important to walk in integrity, to walk in such a way that people trust you, that people look to you and feel good about leaving their things out there where you might could get them. You know, 
that they're not worried about you getting into their car. I've, I've had situations before where I went over to some people's houses and I had to make sure doo -doo 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 -doo, two, three times that I locked that car because I've had experiences where I have had CDs and cassettes missing from my car. And that's years ago, and I still remember those CDs and cassettes missing from my car. But to walk in such a way that people aren't afraid that they got to keep an eye on you while they're at the party. To walk in such a way that, that people can ask you to come to stay at their home and, and trust you to take care of things. Samuel says, I had great responsibility. I had opportunities to do wrong, but why would I do that? I'm working for the Lord. I represent Him. He walked in integrity before everyone. And you can do that if you walk consistently with the Lord. Oh. He says that my sons are among you. That's a reference to the fact that Samuel is standing on this stage alone. His sons are among the members of the crowd. He tried to set them up as judges, but they had acted corruptly and they had to be removed from their positions of authority. His sons did not walk with integrity and and for that reason, they could not be placed in any position of leadership. I'm sure that removing his sons in that way was a tough decision for Samuel to make. I'm sure it was an even tougher one for him to carry out, to have that conversation with them. A tough thing to do, but he did it. Sometimes the leaders of a family, sometimes the leaders of a church, sometimes the leaders of a community, even then of a group of friends, have to make some hard decisions. You have to set some boundaries and some guidelines. You can make those decisions if you continue to walk consistently before the Lord. So Samuel wants the people to know all that about him. He's, he's calling them to recognize that and he's not trying to brag. He simply wants them to know that as he passes the torch to this king, that if the new king fails, it won't be because he set a bad example for Saul. It won't be because he did not give him a template of how to act, a template of how to behave, a, a role as a mentor for him to follow. In this speech, Samuel gives the people a call to recognize and he wants them to recognize the power of God to help a person to walk with integrity, to walk by faith, and to live before others in such a way that honors and glorifies God. He gives them a call to recognize. Second thing that I see is that he gives them a call to remember. Uh, in verse 7, Samuel says, Now take your stand that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord which he did for you and your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, so he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. Verse 10, And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord. So he's giving them a, a history lesson. He's reminding them that at one time that they were in bondage and that the Lord set them free, set them free from the oppression that they faced there in Egypt, brought them to the promised land, uh, took them out of where they were, but they got there and they forgot the Lord their God. Because they forgot the Lord their God, they were judged and they ended up in bondage again, ended up living under the oppression of the adversary again. When they repented and when they cried out, God delivered them. And there was this cycle of, of sin and disobedience, judgment, followed by a cry of repentance, which came at the uh, instruction of the Lord, rising somebody up as a judge to deliver them. So he wants them to remember those things. To remember that the Lord God is holy and that he judges sin. And that in his righteousness, he disciplines you for sin. He wants them to remember that there are always consequences for sin. But when you cry out to the Lord with a repentant heart, He hears and He delivers. I think it's, it's good that we remember uh, history, that, that we don't be selective 
in the history that we study, in the history that we learn, in the history that we remember. I think that we are to remember the good times, but it's just as important for us to remember the bad times. The things we're, we're not proud of. The things where we fell into sin and disobedience. And we need to remember those things so we don't fall into them again because we are people who fall so easily, so readily. It's good to learn from history. If you were to uh, give the Jewish nation at that time a grade for how they remembered history, they probably wouldn't have made a passing grade. They did really good with the names and the dates of the people. They did really good with the names and the dates of certain events. But where they failed was by not learning from their own history. They repeated bad history over and over and over again. And I tell you, that's not a problem that's just common to them in that day. That's a problem that is common for each and every one of us. All of us are susceptible to not learning from our own history. We are creatures of habit. And it's easy to fall back into some of those habits. It's easy to fall back into some of those routines that are not healthy for us. So many times we, we end up trying to get away. We ultimately do get away. And then we return to the very things that are no good for us. And no good to us. I have known people who have broken free from unhealthy relationships only to return to either that same relationship or to become involved in yet another similar unhealthy relationship. And I heard somebody say it like this one time, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat history. And I think we fail to see that and fail to acknowledge that sometimes as individuals. God's Word tries to remind us of the importance of learning from history. I love Romans chapter 15, verse 4. One of the first verses I ever memorized, uh, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. That God has provided His Word for us, given us the, the history of His people, give us the history of, of people who followed Him, people who didn't follow Him, and we can learn from their history. It's important for us to learn from the history that's provided to us in God's Word. As, as Christians, God has delivered each and every one of us, maybe not from that place of Egypt, but from our own place of Egypt, from our own place of bondage. And certainly, we must acknowledge that Christ has delivered us from the penalty for our sin. That He paid the price for us, died for us, rose again for us, not just so that we would have uh, power over the penalty of sin in our lives, but that, that that hold, that grip that sin has on us could be broken. The Lord has delivered us from not just the penalty of sin, but the power of sin in our lives. There's no need for us to be doomed to repeating the same mistakes over and over again in our life. My dad used to tell me that one of the worst mistakes you can make is not to learn from your mistakes. And that's a lot of truth and wisdom in that. We must identify and avoid the situations and relationships that trigger behaviors in us that cause us to get off that path of God's will for us. We must actively and intentionally pray for strength to live out Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, uh, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove, so that you may show, so that you may demonstrate what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The Lord wants us to walk in such a way that people look at us and they see that we are walking in a good and acceptable and perfect way. We're to conform to God's will. We're not to do ours. Um, that's simple, but it's not always easy. But I want to remind you that anything that God asks you to do, He'll help you to do. We talked about the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this morning in Christ praying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And then the Lord sent an angel to strengthen Christ, to prepare him to do 
what God had called him to do, to prepare him, to walk, to strengthen him, to equip him and empower him to go to the cross and fulfill his mission. God will help you fulfill yours as well. He'll strengthen you. He'll put people across your path, people that will help you to do all those things that God has ordained for you to do. People to help you to be who God has called you to be. If you learn from your history, staying on track, walking the right path is so much easier. Samuel called the people to remember their history. Uh, he wanted to pass the torch and he wanted to leave them with some advice that they would not repeat the mistakes of the past. In his, uh, in his speech, in the, the words that he gives to the people, I see that call to recognize. I see that call to remember. I want to close by talking to you about a call to rain and thunder. Verse 14, uh, he says this to the people. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and listen to his voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. And if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Even now, take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and see that your wickedness is great, but you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Samuel stands before the people, reminds them of their history, tells them that if they're going to serve the Lord, things will go good, but when they do not serve the Lord, that his hand is against them. And then he calls for rain and thunder. You know, many times we pray for rain, and we, we want that rain, and we don't mind the thunder. Because we know it's good and it helps things grow. But you got to understand, at this time of year, at the wheat harvest, it was not a good time to have rain and thunder. A heavy rain at that time would knock the grain off of the heads of the wheat. A heavy rain at that time would make the fields muddy and the people wouldn't be able to get out in them and work them. And because they couldn't get out there and work the fields, they would fail to reap a good harvest. Rain at that time of year was a sign of the Lord's displeasure. And the rain that Samuel calls for reinforces this idea, this truth, this precept that there are always consequences for seeking to fulfill our will rather than seeking to fulfill the Lord's will in our life. I think it's also important to notice that, you know, a lot of time has passed in my perspective anyway, from the time the people asked for a king and the time in which the Lord's displeasure of that disobedience, that failure to trust him, there's been a lot of, of time that has passed between them asking for the king and the consequences that are given to them. Uh, those consequences didn't come immediately when the people uh, demanded to be like other nations and have a king. And I this. From that, I, I remember and I know this, that sometimes God's judgment and the consequences for our sins don't always come right away. Um, and because those consequences don't always come right away, that can lead to people uh, falsely believing that, well, you know, I got away with that one. And... Uh, <laughs> That delay can cause us to think that, you know what, we can have things our way, that we can dabble in things that are not godly, and, and really there won't be a, a great impact in our lives or in the lives of our family or the lives of somebody else because, you know what, and some time has passed and water's gone under the bridge and, and nothing bad has happened yet. And so a person can easily begin to think, you know, there weren't any consequences when I became involved in that improper relationship. There weren't any consequences when I started that illicit activity. Nothing bit me when I stuck my toe into that murky water. So everything's good, right, God? That's not the case. Uh, the Lord is patient and long-suffering toward us. Certainly, uh, we have to recognize that, that judgment and consequences do not always come immediately following our sin and our disobedience. Uh, the Bible says 
that the Lord, however, will not hold his wrath forever. The chickens always come home to roost. And they came home to roost on that day because the Lord displayed his wrath for the people's failure to trust him, for the people's sin in wanting to be like just the rest of the world. And rain and thunder came at a time when the people were looking forward to a harvest. People recognized the Lord was upset and they cried out to Samuel in verse 19. Pray for your servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. They call out to, to Samuel and they ask him to intercede for them. To, to pray to the Lord for them. I read that passage and a couple things that I take from that is, is one, that lesson that is there are always consequences for our sin. And they may not come immediately, but they will come Ultimately, when we follow our will rather than God's will, the Lord will send rain and thunder to our lives and he will disrupt the harvest. We won't reap the blessings that we would otherwise have. We won't reap the peace that we would otherwise have. But the good news is that, that Christ will intercede for us. We can repent, we can turn to the Lord, we can recognize and begin to enact in our lives that that, that walking before Him in integrity, turning from our sin and turning to Him, remembering that He is righteous and compassionate and that He does seek to deliver us. And we can know that if we serve Him in truth, He will, lead, he will lead us to live in a way that honors Him. He will successfully help us to pass the torch to the next generation. And sometimes passing the torch to that next generation means talking to them about our own bad history. Talking to them about the fact that there are consequences for behaviors, but that the Lord is good and gracious and ready and willing to forgive. Passing the torch. See, the people uh, here needed to see some sign on that day of the Lord's power of his justice, of his righteousness, of the consequences for sin. They needed to be reminded of God's sovereignty, that they did something wrong and they didn't get away with it just because something didn't immediately transpire. There is a day of judgment. There is a day of reckoning. I think the people also needed to see some sign on that day uh, that would remind them of their dependence on God. I think that our generation today is... a. Uh, I would say I think that they're looking for a sign, but I, I think they're, some of them aren't looking for anything at all. I talk to people sometimes uh, about uh, their faith and their spiritual beliefs and talk to them about God, and sometimes people say, well, you know, I just wish God would give me some kind of sign that, that He's up there and that He cares, that He's involved in our lives. And I, I, I can understand where they're coming from in that regard, but I would tell you that the Lord has already given us a sign, the greatest sign that the world has ever seen. God has given us a sign to prove that He does take sin seriously. He's given us a sign to prove that He is sovereign. He has given us a sign that will show us that if we repent from our sin and turn to Him, we will be forgiven, that we will have reconciliation. He's given us the sign that is the ultimate sign of love. God has demonstrated His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul says in Romans. I like the way John said it in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the sign the world needs to see. That's the sign the world needs to receive. That's the sign that the world needs to embrace, that God has loved us so much that even in our sin and disobedience, even when we have been separated from Him because of our thoughts, our actions, our attitudes, that God is willing to re reconcile us to Himself through the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. Christ gave His life as an atonement for sin and rose on the third day, ascended into heaven, and He intercedes for us, the Bible says, on a daily basis. Greatest sign the world has ever seen. If you've never recognized and responded to that sign, if you've never recognized and responded to the grace and forgiveness offered by Jesus Christ, I invite you to do so today. Would you pray with me, please?